Hello? Hello. Hello. How are you? I can't. Why? I can't get my camera to work, so. Oh. <laughs> oh, there, maybe. Did I get, did that help? I don't know. No, but that's okay. <laughs> so we'll see. Always glitches. Uh, yeah. Yeah, this glitches. Exactly. Oh, there. there I go. had to push yeah. the arrow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Strange, because then, um, okay, and I push the arrow again, and then, yeah, oh well. Okay. <laughs> All right, welcome to the meeting. Uh, I know Jihan can't be with us today, but he, uh, we've been talking on Slack quite a bit this week. Wataru's been, um, I forwarded a lot of that stuff to Wataru, so maybe we can talk about some of that if you want. Um, so do we have any updates from anyone? What's the latest from people? Hi, hi, brother. Hi, how are you? Uh, yeah, week one is going okay. Like I did most of the things that I had, you know, written down as my objectives for week one. Uh, so uh, regarding the things I wanted to check out more, I was telling you like I was looking into two, three more messing algorithms, like the ball pivoting algorithm and the Poison deconstruction one. So. Uh, regarding those things, you know, especially for the Mars shot and the intergalactic shot, you know, objectives. So I'm thinking, you know, something more hopeful than this could be, you know, incorporating another, uh, you know, let, like the solution that I'm currently working at is somewhat similar to a linear programming solution. Okay. It's like uh, we have these, uh, like the sub problems they are doing, you know, uh, they're solving individual sub smaller sub problems and then, you know, they're trying to recreate the 3D model. So, you know, uh, uh, like the DIBR uh, uh, volumetric rendering where, you know, you have a 3D probabilistic point cloud instead of, you know, just a single function giving you one single point cloud. So it's instead of just a single point cloud, you'll have a probabilistic point cloud of, you know, the possible shape that that 3D model could have. So, you know, this could probably be included in the, you know, Mars shot and the intergalactic shot. Portions. I'll, I'll have to, you know, uh, make it more concise and, you know, actually check what the key objectives for doing that would be because I'm still going through people who have, you know, done something similar. But as far as the main uh, method that I was, that I, you know, mentioned in my proposal, I'll, I'm still going ahead with it as the, you know, main objectives for the week as such. So, yeah, that's there. I've already pushed the initial changes to my repo. I'll be pushing them to, I think, the other repo as well. All right. Uh, that's, that's from my say. All right, that's great. Yeah, good start. Uh, it sounds like you're, and then I look forward to seeing the push and, yeah, yeah. getting it in there. And um, you need any, uh, do you need anything, uh, I mean, do you see any uh, obstacles or do you need anything special in terms of... Uh, uh, for now, I'm just going through different things, you know, maybe if uh, with regards to, you know, uh, uh, more uh, like guidance towards how, you know, we'll be developing the final model, I think, towards when we are reaching more towards the, you know, generating the 3D model part, I think then I might need more guidance as to, you know, would this method be better, would that method be better. I'll just be showing you, you know, outcomes of those three methods that I will be using. But, for now, this is, I think, mostly it. Good. Um, now, when you say probabilistic point cloud, what do you mean by that? Like, what would be the uh, difference between that and a regular 3D point cloud? Uh, so, uh, instead of, uh, like, generating just a normal point cloud using the current algorithms, it will just be relying on the contour data, the outlines of the eight images that are there. So, this is the uh, objective method that, you know, I'm, I mentioned in my proposal that I'll be using. So it's just uh, generalizing those uh, eight outlines and then it's creating a point cloud based on those eight points. So when we use a neural net, I'm thinking of using the whole data set. You know, like uh, for stage four, let's say stage four angular MTOs, there must be like around 120 odd images. So based on all those images and, you know, accompanied with the visual cues that that image will have. So it will try to, you know, slightly increase the accuracy of that linear 
the outline that the linear programming uh, method generates. So I'm still, you know, trying to jot down the major objectives that I'll have to go through to achieve accuracy using that method. But so far, you know, if if, if there's any sort of improvement that can happen, it's probably using that method only. Because linear, linear programming otherwise will should give decent results. But yeah, that's like another thing that I was thinking of branching off. You know, maybe this project towards. But yeah. Well, that's great. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think that's a good plan forward. And so yeah, so yeah. instead of like using just eight images for you know generating the whole three D model, we'll be using cues from other uh, images as well. All right, well, that's great. Um, and your goals, your coming goals for the coming week are. Uh, what do you plan to help to get done this week? Yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, for this week, uh, that's, uh, I think I'd written down uh, modifying uh, different uh, extraction techniques for the outline on itself. So I'll just be tweaking uh, or contrasting the image to get you know better outlines. I think that was there. So the image modification techniques using you know the contrast, uh, like contrasting the embryo and the background to a certain degree so that you know you can get a better outline. That's that's the objective. Okay. Well, that sounds good. Thank you. Good. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Karan. That sounds like a good start. So, uh, who wants to go next, uh, Wataro or Hari Krishna? Hi, Bradley. Yeah. I'd like, I'd like to make a request for some help. Okay. <laughs> when you're ready. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Are you talking to me? No, I'm talking to Bradley. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, uh, okay what time? Okay. Um, um, no, not much update for me, but um, I decided to implement the, the uh, calls for um, uh, converting the video data to um, nodes and edges uh, by using um, DevLearn and some other um, libraries. Yep. Yeah. That's good. And Jihan is is implementing the second stage, which is to convert the uh, raw data into the graphs. Okay. Uh, so you're you're kind of taking video data, converting it into some uh, set of numbers, and then uh, Jihan is working on the graph part, converting it into graphs. At least the first pass. Yes. Okay. All right, that sounds good. Um, do you have any? Uh, do you have any? Do you found any? Have you found any issues that you want to uh, talk about be, that need to be addressed? Or I know we talked about how to do the division of labor, and that was something that I said it would be fine if you worked comp in a complementary way on like some of the uh extraction tasks and that and then you know differentiating your projects sort of towards like what you're doing with implementation and things like that so that was kind of the um i mean it, that give saying having said that i i know that you guys are kind of figuring out how to get some of this in like from images to something you can work with so that's I guess that's the next step is to keep working on that or to improve upon that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, again, you know, um, make sure that we keep in contact about that. And if you have questions or if you have like thoughts about how this, this is going to be done, let's, let's talk about it. Um, I don't have like, I don't have all the answers, but I can help you. Because we've done this a number of times, so. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Hare Krishna. Yeah, hello. Yeah. 
uh, I'm audible, right? Yes. Yeah, so this way, like, I found uh, two ways in which like, I think I could proceed with. Um, and uh, one of the ways was uh, using the images, I would be finding the camera positions. Like, it's a method called exception. And uh, with that, using those positions, I can then um, create a point cloud maybe uh, using the studio vision package. And that's I open it while uh, reading more about it. So um, I'm trying with, the, with the, that method now, for now. And also, I'm also trying uh, with an algorithm called call map, which I found. And I will try it out today. And uh, I'll see if the results are good. Yeah, that's it from my update. OK. Uh, so this is something you'll be doing over the next week. The trying out this package and okay uh yeah yeah harry I, I i've got a uh, uh a suggestion uh susan and i got together yesterday uh evening and uh uh we agreed a good starting point would be to take two images that overlap and plot the uh some measure of the overlap uh, uh, in terms of theta and phi, where theta and phi are the spherical coordinates. Now, if you did that over a grid in theta and phi, and you flattened it, it would be what's called a Mercator projection. Okay, if you know you your projections, okay, uh, projections of globes. Uh, and then we could see if it's a rough landscape or if it has a simple peak. And that would then that would then uh, suggest which kinds of optimization algorithms might work and which would fail. So we just plot the, plot that function over versus theta and phi. So it's a two-dimensional scene, and the question is, does does that come out as a rough landscape, or or does it have a single peak that's easy to climb to? Okay, I okay. get it. You get it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And if it's got a lot of little hills before you hit the big hill, that's called a rough landscape. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Okay. Uh, but I think by seeing that landscape, you could then visualize just how bad the problem is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Okay. Okay. Uh, so Susan would like to schedule uh, some time with you. So. Uh, uh, I hope you two will figure out a time. I'll join if you want me to. Okay? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. I know 11 a.m. here is very late in India. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah er earlier on Sunday would be fine with me. Um, yeah, yeah, it's fine oh, with me. Oh, there. My camera decided to work. Okay. Oh, yeah, it's working better than yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> it's nice of it. I never know. <laughs> um, did you avoid the hail yesterday? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, we, did. we did too. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, yeah. We're, uh, yeah, it, it's the last day of planting today. If we don't get it in today, then you oh. don't get any insurance. Our, if it rained here, here. You, did it rain there? No. Nope, oh, it didn't here. rain. Oh, mm -hmm. oh, it rained here. Okay, so you don't have to plant in mud. <laughs> no, no. We're 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 basically done. We're just doing potholes. Okay, good. <laughs> anyway, so um, I hopefully we'll have more time because everything's at least in the ground, and so is my garden. So um, okay. Yeah. So if if you just um. Susan is a real farmer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, so just um, um, you set the time uh, because um, I'm available. Like, I don't like to get, get up before 8 in the morning, but other than that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, I'm up by seven in the morning. So, 
Whatever, whatever works best. Okay, Harry, so you, t- you let us yeah. know. Um, okay. Like it's Sunday, uh, in, yeah. in India, Sunday night would be fine. I, was, I don't know what time it will be there. I just have to check. Oh, here it's morning. <laughs> yeah. So it's about... Yeah, Any time on Sunday night is fine. It's about 10 and a half hours difference, I think. So. Just, just okay. figure out... A- 9 a.m. 9 a.m. Central Standard Time. Uh, yeah. That sound good for you? Yeah, that would work. That would work. Okay, Harry, figure out what time that is for you. 9 a.m. Yeah, Central I'll Standard Time. Yeah, that that would be 7:30, I guess. Yeah, that that should be okay. 7:30 p.m. for us. Yeah, yeah okay. that would be fine. Okay. All right. Well, we'll we'll try for that then, because I. They have all of these images that aren't doing anything, and I put 300 uh, of them up on uh, sync, and I'll go fishing for some more. Yeah, and Harry, I, did you get the message that uh, you have access to those images now? Uh, they're, um, they're in a cloud called sync.com. Yeah, 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 yeah I got them. Okay. The advantage, the advantage of that is you can send very large files. Don't have to worry about the, the size the way you do with email. Yeah, that's okay. So um, I don't know if Dick had something he wanted to wanted help with. He said. Uh, yeah, yeah. We have a, a book coming up on diatom on chain diatoms. That's Diatoms that form colonies and chains. And that, of course, includes our favorite Bacillaria. Okay? So uh, there are an enormous number of movies of Bacillaria online. And uh, the typical movie nowadays is made at 30 frames per second. Uh, the first analysis of the... Uh, uh, the jerky motion of single diatoms was done at 10 frames per second. So 30 frames per second should be adequate. In other words, we don't need any new movies made at higher speeds. Yeah. Okay, so the problem is this. The bacillaria, if you have a single diatom, it seems to move in a jerky fashion. In other words, it, 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 it moves like... Like that, <laughs> okay? But bacillaria looks like it's moving smoothly. So the question is, can we act, we need to actually measure that from movies and see if bacillaria it moves in a smooth or jerky fashion? That's the question. Is it smooth or jerky? Some people believe it's smooth. Some people believe it's jerky, but nobody's measured it. <laughs> so... Obviously, we need a cell tracking algorithm, and we need discussion about how accurate it is and uh, and uh, whether the differences from frame to frame are smooth or jerky, and what the error measure, what the error bar would be on that measurement. Yeah. Okay, so we need a volunteer who <laughs> who wants to take some of these cell analysis stuff that's been done and and analyze. Some movies. I mean, which movies? I'm not sure, but there's so many online. We can pick which ones would be best. Right. Obviously, the close, the higher the magnification, the more you can see the single cell accurately. But then you can only see one cell, yeah. <laughs> or only a couple cells. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so this would be aimed at a chapter in this book on chain diatoms. Okay, and there's no rush on it. Uh, the book is just being formulated now. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. It's worth mentioning that we had uh, we've done work on this in the past with uh, both uh, Thomas Harbick, who's acquired images of Bacillaria on his own. Yeah, and then uh, Ujwal and Asmit Singh, who both worked yeah. on um, doing these algorithms where they. Yeah, uh, the Th- Thomas is one who thinks it's smooth, but okay. I don't believe him without a measurement. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, Thomas might get involved once we have a group together and decided to go ahead. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, but I, I, I'm serious. This would, this would make a very nice paper. And if it turns out to be smooth, it will be very unusual because single pennate diatoms are jerky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then, then the question comes, why? Yeah. <laughs> if it turns out to be jerky, it will just fit in with the others. Right. <laughs> okay. So one of, one of the diatom mysteries. Right. So Thomas thinks it's smooth. He thinks it's smooth, but he doesn't have proof. This is for basal area? Or... Yeah, yeah. Okay. Basal area. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I know the people, the GSOC students uh, probably haven't seen the stuff we've done on basal area. So, uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Hey, maybe you have to well, ask some of the people got involved before then. Yeah, Say what? but I mean, it's not, yeah, it's not, it's not that hard. It, it's basically, there are these organisms called diatoms, and there are a lot of different diatoms in the world. They, they're marine <laughs> microorganisms, and uh, they have very, they have a very special, um, you know, they have a phenotype that's basically a, an accretion of silica and maybe some other materials. Uh, they grow, and they have these interesting life cycles, and they have various modes of movement. And so we're interested in how they kind of move around in colonies and even in single cells. Um, so this this is something that, you know, if you're interested, we can talk more about. But um, it's, yeah. it's a very, very big area. And, you know, it's it's one of these things where you can find data online. We, we started that project by going to YouTube and finding videos that people have made just kind of like they can make take diatoms, put them in a like a, a liquid culture. Uh, you know, under a, like an amateur observer can take a microscope uh, and put it under a microscope and see, you know, the diatoms moving. And then, you know, you can do different experiments with them. So they're not hard to find. Uh, they're fairly easy to get movies of because you can put it under a, a standard microscope that you can get it, you know, a couple hundred dollars microscope. So, uh, you know, it's 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 not hard to collect data, and so people have done that and put it on YouTube. The the hard part is actually analyzing it for useful information, and that's what we've been trying to do with this project. And yeah, um, yeah so yeah, so if, if anyone needs motivation, one twenty percent of the oxygen you breathe comes from diatoms. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there's also been a lot of work on biofuels and on other types of oh, things. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All sorts of stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Okay. Uh, but, uh, you yeah, know, we need somebody who, who has some experience with cell tracking. That might be you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like that. Um, yeah. I think it was Gia Hung who was asking me about cell tracking. So I don't know. He's not here today, but I might ask him about, like, I don't okay. know. I, yeah, I mean, you know, I, yeah. So I'll I'll, I'll talk Jesse, to him about it maybe. Too. Was Jesse involved in that? Sorry. No, he wasn't. Oh, he wasn't. Okay. No. Um, yeah. So yeah, I don't, I don't know who might be yeah. good for that, but it's it's you know it's something that is. Uh, I mean, the I think the tools exist. Yeah, like, out yeah. There. It's a it's it's a <laughs> right. question of doing it carefully and making sure that. Uh, uh, coming up with a criterion for distinguishing smooth from jerky. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, by the way, we did analyze the jerky motion of individual diatoms and concluded that uh, it looked like uh, Brownian motion with drift. Okay. You know that. Okay, so that could be used as as a baseline. Right. Yeah. So yeah, for people who don't know Brownian motion, um, Brownian motion is it's it's you can observe it if you put like bacteria under a microscope sometimes, or some other microorganisms, and they kind of move around. They dance around a central point. They kind of like almost like they're vibrating. 
and if you if you look at it, you know you, this is something that they do. They kind of move around like that, and sometimes they move to explore their environment or whatever. But people have characterized this with some sort of um, uh, like a, a standard uh, distribution, uh, like a Gaussian distribution, and they call it Brownian motion. Um, and then there are different variations on that. So you can have like drift, where it kind of drifts off that center point a bit. And it kind of explores outward. There's also what they call super diffusion, which is where it goes out quite a bit. So it's it's a different distribution. Now you're talking about like an exponential distribution where it starts to move out further from that center point and then returning. And so there are different ways that these these types of biological movement happen. I know we uh, in my other group we've talked about levy flights, which are actually very distinct from Brownian motion, but they're something that you see often in foraging where the organisms explore a little patch and then move to another patch of resources, but it's like this long distance flight every so often that they make. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's, a, it's, an, inter it's an interesting area of yeah. <laughs> exploration. Uh, so it may seem a bit esoteric, but it's, <laughs> yeah. it's fun. Well, yeah, diatoms are really easy. I mean, compared to like C. elegans, diatoms are fairly easy to work with because C. elegans, you know, you're you're tracking a bunch of cells and they're dividing. And diatoms, you usually have like a single cell or a colony of cells that are very num uh, small in number, fairly small in number. And then, yeah, and the, yeah, yeah, the shell, the shell of the diatom is essentially made of glass, so it's on that on that scale, it's quite rigid. Okay. So so that means you can track it without worrying about cell shape change. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and we did we did do some cell tracking algorithms. Ojuwan and Esmet uh, did some uh, deep learning algorithms, uh, ba like just basically finding landmarks on the cell. So you know you have the cell and C. elegans. We often look at the uh, the edges of the cell, the membrane. And then we look at the maybe try to find a centroid, or if we're lucky, we can find like a nucleus area, and you know use that as as landmarks on the cell. In Basilaria, for example, one of the diatom species, you have different landmarks that are basically the same from cell to cell. So you have like uh, you know the ends, you have some other features that are uh, fairly easy to identify. So if they rotate around. Um, it's not a problem. We can always keep the the cell tracked, so it's it's a lot it's it's a lot easier to track the cells, but it's a lot harder to actually track the motion of the cell moving around in the scene. So, yeah. Okay. So are okay. we? Uh, okay. Yeah. That's the, pro that's the project. Smooth yeah. jerky. <laughs> So, uh, Susan, did you have any uh, thing, any updates, or did you already give your update? Update? Yeah. Um. Oh well. Oh, there it came. Um, do I have any updates about what uh, about my tensegrity project, or? Yeah. That would um, be, yeah. <laughs> Uh, oh, I managed to draw a hexagonal uh, group of cells, but they tend to fall over because they're not held up, but they're supposed to be held up by other tissue. So I have to figure out how to put some springs on the corners to hold them up so they don't get, I don't get empty matrices. What was the other? And I got uh, empty matrix error and too many eigenvector error. <laughs> too, too many eigenvectors. Yes. Uh, so I, I, I'm still working on it. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's just, uh, you're trying to model this in, in Comsol, I think you said? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and I did get a single cell when I, I did it properly and I put a twist on on the uh, configuration 
but that is that's a single cell, it's not a tissue. So now yeah. I'm trying to do the tissue. And Susan, have you tried just as a, a check doing this standard tiny tensegrity structure that's known to be stable? Oh yeah, I I well. Okay. I got well, one that's more or less stable. Okay, but if you simulate the simple ones, uh, you know, where they have uh, uh, about four struts and... and yeah, I've, I've got one that's three struts, yeah, and I've got one that's four, but then I decided I'd just try the hexagon one, and I've got a fairly stable hexagon. Yeah. But, oh, okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. It reminds me, I once tried to simulate, I think it was neural tube folding, and it acted like putting a... Uh, to, uh, a tomato into hot water. It just burst all over the place. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, maybe that's what it means by an empty matrix. I don't know. <laughs> Error, yeah. Empty ma matrix. <laughs> uh, Programs weren't that clever in those days. <laughs> I mean, I had concluded it looked like a tomato. The program didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's just trying to get it to be stable and get the right parameters so that it is stable is yeah, some, so somewhat of a trick. When, a, when AI can tell you it looks like it's made a drop in hot water, I'll believe it. <laughs> so, so it's just, uh, the problem with the program is that it it you put it together and then it does nothing. Yes, so then yeah. you know it's really bad. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so if it gives you error messages, at least you know you're, it did something. <laughs> yes, that's my problem with Mathematica. Yeah. <laughs> no error messages, just does nothing. <laughs> just does nothing, yeah. That, that's just really bad. <laughs> anyway, yeah. I, yeah. I'm having fun with it. Yes, not oh, with good. it. I don't know, six hours. <laughs> okay. That's yeah. great. Yeah. Anyways, I'm I'm still working on it. They kind of gave me all summer to fix it. Oh, so this is for your uh, program? Yeah, yeah. This is for the um, my candidacy. I have for the candidacy uh, in my department. I do a project and then I I write it up. It has to be four thousand to six thousand words. And it has to be um, related to the PhD thesis, but not the PhD thesis. Right. So I'm not sure how that works because I might want to use it yeah. for <laughs> something else. <laughs> so I'm not sure. Anyway, maybe I'll have to just say, oh, well, if you don't like that, I have this ball microscope. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just use that. It's already published. <laughs> <laughs> well, we I have, yeah, I mean, you have, if you learn ComSol, it's like, you know, it, it puts you at an advantage for doing something else in it. I mean, you know, yeah. 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 Well, uh, I'm, uh, I look at the drawings that are done in the papers. They never say they use ComSol, but it sure looks like it. Right. So it's some sort of finite element analysis method, and it, it looks like console. Yeah. So there's a link in the chat on an example of basilaria. If you're interested, if, if Ron and Harry Krishna are interested in seeing the one example video of this, this is a YouTube video. Yeah, there, there are probably hundreds. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But yeah. yeah, they're just, you know, they're just short videos. It doesn't take much to uh, show the process of, you know, like a lot of times, like in Bacillary in the colonies, they have this accordion-like motion where you want to yeah. capture that process. And that's pretty much the video. So it's not, and, you know, a lot of the videos on YouTube, they have uh, a lot of, like, artifact, like, you know, uh, like, other bacteria in the water and things like that and uh but that's something that can be filtered out really it's a matter of finding the landmarks and tracking them it's not that difficult with like bacteria generally don't get in the way other algae uh but sometimes they do so it's just a matter of like 
And yeah, it, but the, you can actually possibly use them because that tells you about the flow of material around the diatoms. Oh, sure, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Which is, which is another very interesting question. Are you familiar with PIV? Yeah, we. I think we talked about that once. I don't yeah, know. PIV, particle uh, image velocimetry, I think it is. Right. Uh, we tried that once when I was visiting uh, in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, and uh, the guy I was working with suggested, we did it on a single diatom while it was moving through a bunch of particles. And he suggested that it looks like they have what's called anomalous, uh, anomalous, uh, what we could call it, uh, uh, boundary slippage. In other words, it looked like a diatom might actually smooth its way yeah. in some fashion. And that hasn't been explored. He doesn't have that kind of equipment anymore. He will, and uh, it's an open question as to whether Bastillaria... See, if Bastillaria can slip through water more easily than you'd expect from Stokes Law, okay, then they might be a key to uh, reducing the friction on boats. Yeah. Okay, there's a lot of work trying to do that. Uh, trying to make boats take less energy to go through water. Okay, yeah. so, uh, yes, so diatoms could have practical applications. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so okay, so that and then at any rate, that's that's another thing that needs to be done is to watch diatoms move with a bunch of particles around them to see if we can figure out if there's anything special about the movement. Okay. Uh, how much of a um, magnification do you need? Oh, you need, uh, it depends on the size of the, of the diatom. Diatoms can range from uh, about three microns to uh, five hundred. Okay. okay. How about okay. the basilaria? Do you know? Basilaria is, I think, around 50 microns long. Oh, okay. So, uh, this here looks like a little crocodile. Well, just imagine this is not a crocodile. Um, just imagine that really? this is the water organism. <laughs> that's not. That's something open which suddenly started talking. Uh -huh. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, well, yeah, that well, maybe we can explore that in the, you know, in the we'll come back to that yeah. at some point soon. Yes. I, yeah, we kind of put that aside for a while, but it's still an open uh, set of problems. So uh, I'm going to share my screen now and I talk about a couple things that. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what's that? <laughs> That's, oh, a friend of mine, long deceased, called my obsession with diatoms Eine Lange Krankheit. Which is the... You can look that up. It's in, term, it's in German or Yiddish. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Do a machine translation. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, you can see my screen? Yeah. All right. So a couple of things I, I found this week that are interesting, uh, maybe, you know, especially see, I guess they're nematode related. Um, so the first one I'm going to talk about is this paper, and I posted this in the uh, OpenWorm Slack, which uh, is, there's a channel called uh, Recent Papers or something like that. And uh, this is a group, it's Max Tegmark, who's a physicist, Ed Boring, who's uh, at MIT, does kind of like these, uh, uh, he does like uh, biological engineering, 
Uh, Avatar Yamini, who's been involved in Open Worm in the past. So he's done a lot of interesting stuff. And um, so this is a good uh, group of people. And they have this paper towards a more accurate C, uh, 3D atlas of C. elegans neurons. So this is uh, by, uh, by BMC Bioinformatics, and it's just recently published this year. So what they're doing in this paper is they're actually looking at um, cells. They're looking at volumetric images, and they're tagging um, nuclei and neurons. And they want to like pick. They want to create an atlas that's the most accurate atlas that exists. So Openworm, the idea of building a worm, you know, a digital worm. Um, comes from a lot of the initiatives prior to that where they were collecting data on the cells uh, because in C. elegans you can identify every cell you know where it is in the worm but the resolution of where those cells are is hard to get I mean every every C. elegans basically has the same uh, sort of uh, cell fate map in, in the sense that you know where every cell is it basically has the same position relative to the uh, contour of the body, the edges of the body of the worm. So, you know, these things don't vary that much. Sometimes in mutants you see variation, but otherwise you really don't see a lot of variation. Um, even in the, it, you know, we work with hermaphrodites usually, even in the males, most of the cells are in the same location from worm to worm. So that makes it a very nice system to look at these sorts of um, you know, the, the to try to characterize the position of cells and their function and their arrangement in the in the adult uh, worm, but getting it, you know, getting accuracy there, you know, having a good accurate map is kind of hard. And, and we've talked about the reasons for that in this group. You know, a lot of it is finding the right algorithm to uh, segment images of these um, structures that go into building the entire worm. Some of it is identifying the actual cell itself, so annotating the cell properly. And so in this paper, they're going to go through a series of methods that they're using, um, which is this NeuroPal method, to build a more accurate map. And in this paper, they actually do reference some of the openworm data that's been used in the past. And the openworm data comes from a number of different groups who have done this before. So um, this is not, you know... The open worm group hasn't really, you know, uh, collected uh, their own data, been using data from other groups. This is a new sort of data set that's, that could be used by open worm if we had, um, you know, once it's, this is published. Um, and it could be used to update our model that we have. So the background is, um, so they're using these you know, volumetric images that tag neuronal nuclei. Um, and this is something that people do in neuroscience, but they also do it in developmental biology and in biology in general, using different uh, markers to look at the cell. So you can use, uh, you know, you can use different fluorescent markers to tell you things about the cell. You can talk about, you know, you can generate uh, a, you know, a standard uh, uh, set of nuclei markers of fluorescent markers that will mark cells their sort of their center position or their um, nucleus it's it's a little unclear sometimes as to what those actually are in the cell but you can use those to tag like the position in space and you know maybe an identity of the cell in terms of where it is relative to other cells but you can also do things like turn on other types of uh, fluorescent markers so Sometimes you can do these multi-channel markers where you use different filters on your microscope. You use like a, a, a blue channel or a red channel or a green channel. And all those different channels, if you look at it in a, a, a fluorescent, under a fluorescent microscope, you can see different markers uh, expressed at different levels. So these are good for looking at different things that determine the cell's identity, such as if it's a neuron, if it's a somatic cell, if it's some type of neuron, and so forth. And so you can tell those things through those markers, and you can combine those markers in different ways. So there's a lot of information that can be gathered from just microscopy data, not just these shape parameters or these uh, positional parameters, but other parameters as well. 
So uh, frequently cell identity is determined by aligning and matching tags to an atlas of labeled neuronal positions. So this is what I'm talking about with respect to position. In C. elegans, for example, they've assembled a lot of these maps using the neuronal positions in the worm. So they know kind of the X, Y, Z position of each cell and they know where it's supposed to be uh, and other identifying characteristics. So, but they don't really, I don't think people have done um, something like look at the expression of different uh, genes in the cell or look at the expression of different uh, neurotransmitters in a cell. Uh, they've done this uh, in C. elegans, I know, um, more generally, like, you know, doing these sort of uh, uh, transcriptomic assays where they look at, like, what a single cell is expressing. But linking that to some sort of atlas where you're able to uh, generate, so the, you know, to generate uh, a map of these different properties really hasn't been done in C. elegans. Um, now, the, the um, Allen Institute in Seattle, they've done a lot of that with uh, human and, and mouse brain slices. They've actually uh, done different types of antibody stains and different types of put different types of fluorescent markers in mouse brains to look at some of these things and assemble maps that way. But that's a different type of map than what we're talking about here. Um, previous analyses of such C. elegans data sets have been hampered by the limited accuracy of such atlases, especially for neurons present in the ventral nerve cord and also by time-consuming manual elements of the alignment process. So there's a lot of processing that goes on with this to build these atlases, um, and that, that's something they're trying to minimize the, the labor on here as well. So in this case, we present a novel automated alignment method for sparse and incomplete point clouds. So these are these point clouds that uh, we're interested in building, or Quran's interested in building for... Um, axolotl and you know having this so the people who use point clouds for a lot of things in this area of biology and building these point clouds allows you to see these things in space or a map from like a bunch of cells a bunch of markers to a spatial distribution um so they're you know they're trying to align these point clouds resulting from typical c elegans fluorescence microscopy data sets so we have those data sets um, in our uh, GitHub repository. And um, I think it's this one. And so we have, of course, the data sets that we talked about last week. We have cell birth and death timing data. We have raw nucleus data. We have uh, some other species. So there, there are different data sets in our GitHub. Uh, there are also data sets available um, in, from different repositories that allow you to, um, you know, get the, get the raw data, get something that's been processed. There's this alignment process that needs to happen as well sometimes when you're working from something that's just a set of images. Uh, I'm not sure. I think we're doing that now with Axolotl, but this is a paper if you're interested in some of the state-of-the-art techniques people are using for C. elegans, this is a paper to read and go through a little bit more carefully. Um, their method that they're introducing in this paper involves a tunable learning parameter and a kernel that enforces biologically realistic deformation. So they use a, a algorithm that assumes deformation of the worm, and they're using that to sort of uh, correct for a lot of the noise that you'll find when you're trying to align the cells with uh, each other. We also present a pipeline for creating alignment atlases from data sets of the recently developed NeuroPal transgene. So this is a, a new method that they're using. That's a transgenic method that allows you to generate these different fluorescent markers and get them to express in different cells. So they're actually doing this, the secondary part of this is creating a pipeline for these uh, different methods. So you have these different methods that are generating data and you want to align them into a, 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 a uh, an atlas, and so you have to create a pipeline for that. Um, in combination, these advances allow us to label neurons in volumetric images with confidence much higher than previous methods. So this is uh, the most complete full-body C. elegans 3 positional neuron atlas incorporating positional variability. So we have 
some variability in C. elegans uh, individuals. Sometimes it's a stochastic. In other words, you know, there are different tiny changes between worms in terms of the position because, you know, just that's the way it works. Um, but sometimes, you know, you have mutants, you have other types of situations where you have a technical error. And so accounting for all those things actually makes this much, uh, much more accurate. Um, and so uh, this is incorporating positional variability derived from at least seven animals per neuron for the purposes of cell type identity prediction and for myriad applications, such so looking at cell fate maps or imaging neuronal activity or gene expression. So people would be using this atlas to look for, you know, to align it with their uh, transcription data, for example, or look at like neuronal activity. There are different types of ways to measure neuronal activity and to map it to the spatial map. So that's what they're trying to do here. So in this paper, they actually go through the method. And this is interesting. This figure one shows examples of uh, different C. elegans atlases that came before. And so um, here, the blue dots in this atlas, and this is, uh, I believe this is the, uh, well, this is the, the uh, anterior end of, C, of the C. elegans. So this is the head, and these are the neurons around in the head. So this is a map of all the neurons and their positions. And this is in millimeters, so you have X, Y, and Z coordinates in millimeters. So the data that we have um, that we're using for the embryo, we don't use millimeters, we just use uh, just a standard set of units, which could be mapped to millimeters. So they're using these cell tracking the cell tracking information about the units that are derived from that, and then they're scaling it to the, the uh, appropriate metric measurement. So this is uh, similar to what we have for C. elegans in the embryo, but this is in the adult, and the blue dots are... Bradley, yeah. Did they produce a vector version of that where there's a line drawn between corresponding cells? Uh, I don't think in this paper, but... I think it may. Yeah, that, yeah. that would tell you whether it's a simple transformation or a real mix-up. Okay. Yeah. But yeah. I don't know if they have that. Um, it probably could be generated from the data, though. Yeah, you could generate. You could generate. They 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 threw that information out in this picture. Yeah. Yeah. So the blue dots are from the open worm uh, atlas. For, for example, uh, you could you could say that. One possibility is that the only difference is the different preservation techniques. Yeah, yeah. Okay, you know, you could have a different amount of shrinkage, for example, in which case the, the uh, a vector diagram would be very simple. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. So this is the blue dots are the open worm positions. And the red dots are the white at all. White, uh, John White is uh, one of the uh, people who I think first developed this atlas of neurons for C. elegans. These are the red dots. And then they're, they're improved upon an open worm because they use some, um, they used other, other uh, more recent data and then they did some alignments. And so these, are, these represent average positions. So these are across worms. There's going to be some, you know, uh, like shrinkage of the specimen and things like that as you're measuring it. So there are a lot of things that yeah. come into play. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Since you know at least one of these people, maybe you can ask them to try to make a vector diagram. Uh, maybe. <laughs> I can see if they... <laughs> yeah, they probably could be done from the data. The, the data are, I think, publicly available, for, at least for open worm, it could be done. Oh, you're not, okay. Then regenerate from scratch. No yeah. Works. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, so the, so yeah, you could generate uh, a vector example of this, and it would be uh, yeah, which we don't yeah, have. just a line going from each red dot to its corresponding blue dot. Yeah, yeah, something like that, where you have yeah, yeah. okay, okay, yeah. So this is this is an example of the different data sets that exist, and this is an example of like they're improving upon these results. So you can see that there's some, well, you can't really tell from here, but there's, you know, um, there's there's a difference between the two 
and yeah, you could use a vector diagram to, to see the difference and how it's what it, what the differences are. But um, you know that the accuracy is not you know. I mean, you can see like in the white data, it's like following these edges of the cube here. So there are approximations that are you know improve. You're just improving upon some approximations, and uh, that's that's what you're that's what they're kind of improving upon. And then they show their Neuropel Atlas construction. So this is for just kind of reconstructing data from these, uh, you know, aligning the neurons uh, using the, the labels and incorporating unlabeled neurons into this uh, framework. So they're taking, you know, these labels, they're using that information, they're aligning the neurons, and then they're also incorporating unlabeled neurons. And they're using this Neuropel Atlas as a sort of a uh, source. Um, and so they talk about some of their pipeline. They talk about, I don't know if there are any other uh, images in here that are, are we, oh, here's one where they show how they're modeling the phenotype of the worm. So they're doing this sort of uh, geometric model where they start with an worm image at the top left. They determine the hall, which is the top center image, this black image. And then they have this these tangent circles, which actually map out um, sort of the position for these neurons. So the neurons, you find them in the head, which is here, the tail, and then there are a few scattered about in the mid uh, center of the organism. And then you're trying to figure out like the how to approximate that position best. They're using these uh, these tangent circles. 1,000 of them across the worm. So the resolution is pretty uh, tight in terms of distance uh, between the tangent circles. You can see the overlap here. And, you know, that's how they're you know, putting these in place. Uh, and then this is a sagittal view of this derived atlas. So you can see that you have the position from head to tail. Uh, this is the head. This is the tail at 800 uh, nano or mic microns. Uh, ventral dorsal, you have this variation of 50 microns, so it's it's a very, you know, it doesn't have a lot of uh, uh, ventral dorsal depth, which is top to bottom, but or bottom to top, uh, but there's a lot of length, and so this is basically showing these positions, and so they're improving yeah. upon the existing data. Bradley? Yeah. Again, in, in that diagram, it might be informative if they drew lines between cells that are known to be connected. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, in which case you get a network. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, so the connectome is, but they don't, yeah, they don't show that. I don't know why they don't, because it's kind of the thing that yeah, we well, care about the most. <laughs> criticize them for writing, for publishing an incomplete paper. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, there are a lot of different ways that one can define the connectome. Maybe that's why they didn't do it. So you can do like a synaptic connections and you can also do like, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, gap junction connections. Um, this is uh, transverse view. So this is just looking straight down from the, from the front of the worm. So it doesn't really have a face, but it would be the face of it. And you look down the worm like that and you see this transverse view. Just kind of like this, if you're looking kind of at the sort of the front of the brain, I guess that would be what it would look like. Um, so these point clouds can be used like this. So you can, you can, you know, reconstruct things and they kind of look like the real thing, but they just kind of look like points. Uh, that's, that's kind of what you want to aim for in your point clouds if you're looking for certain uh, subsystems. So if you're looking for a brain... You know, it would be like all the neurons and they should be arrayed in something that looks something like, a, you know, has like a, a cluster where it should be and it has some featured, some definition to it. That's that's, that's a, interesting. There's there's no um, dots in the middle. Yeah, that's actually like a hole in the in the uh, connectome. And I think it's just like there's a ring of uh, there's a nerve ring in here you know, that where the neurons are aligned around. And so there's an area where there are no, you know, the connectome has a hole in it, basically. It's the center part of the worm. 
Yeah, Bradley, do you have the uh, data by which you could draw that network? Um, I do have, yeah, I do have some data for this. I mean, it could be done. Um, okay, it might, it might be worth the paper to <laughs> yeah, visualize yeah. that network. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, let's see. I don't know if there are any other figures. Right, if, you're going, if you're going to the cells issue. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I could do that. <laughs> Oh, here's a network. Yeah, this is, yeah, so this is illustrative illustration of simulated biological noise simulated with the biorealistic deformation field. So this is where you have your original points and your distorted points, and then you have deformation points, which are these black dots. And so the idea is you're deforming it in different ways, and you can show like a field, a deformation field that moves the neurons. So these are, I, I don't know why they're doing this necessarily. I guess it's for hyperparameter tuning to just make sure that this method is robust and that it has, uh, you know, they're able to test it in different ways like this. It can deform it to see if it, it maintains its position or its relative position to other individuals. Um, and then that's, I think that's it. Uh, there's, you know, they're just doing a lot of testing on the method and that's the paper it, it's it's a pretty uh, i think it's a pretty good paper seems like it could be potentially groundbreaking um and so uh the other paper i wanted to talk about uh is this paper on uh romano uh romano mermis uh Colicivorax. I'm having trouble pronouncing that, but that's the uh, the Latin name for this nematode that they're going to look at in this paper. So we're familiar with C. elegans. C. elegans has a very specific type of development. It has these, uh, you know, this sort of deterministic development where every cell in the lineage tree becomes a certain type of cell, and we have like this sort of deterministic. Uh, type of developments. We have lineage, uh, cell lineages that we have an AB lineage that has a variety of different tissues that can be derived from it. We have other uh, lineages such as D and E which derive specific types of tissues like muscle and, uh, and epidermis and, so, and then a germline. And so you know the C. elegans lineage tree is very simple in that sense that you have this type of development um, where it's, you know, and it's all arranged from like this anterior to posterior uh, manner. So the lineage tree actually unfolds according to some uh, anatomical uh, position. So, but in this other nematode, and in fact, nematodes are very diverse in terms of their uh, development. So as it turns out, uh, other nematodes have different types of development. They have, uh, you know, different amount, different numbers of cells across individuals and in the species. Uh, C. elegans is something that they call eutelic, which means that it has the same number of cells in every individual in the species. So, if you, unless you again you have mutants, you can go from C. elegans to C. elegans. The males actually have a slightly larger number of cells, but again. If you go from male to male, you have the same number of cells. But that's not true of all nematodes. Uh, some nematodes have more cells, some have fewer, some have a little bit more complex uh, developmental uh, 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 state, stages and patterns. And then you get to this uh, nematode here. So this is a, a, a vastly different um, method for constructing a nematode, which just means that its development is vastly different from what we find in C. elegans. So the current picture of embryonic development in nematodes is essentially shaped by C. elegans and its close relatives. As their pattern of embryogenesis is rather similar, it is often considered to be representative for the taxon nematoda as a whole. But of course, nematoda is a very diverse taxon and it includes, I think, thousands of species. So there are a lot of different species of nematode. Some of them are, you know, have a, a similar type of development to C. elegans, but they have different numbers of cells, like I said. But there's some that have a vastly different type of development. 
So here we give for the first time a comprehensive description of embryonic development and an ancestrally diverged nematode. So that means that this is uh, a nematode that's related to C. elegans uh, very far back in evolutionary history and that there's a divergence a long time ago and that C. elegans forms a sort of one path, possible path forward for nematode uh, development, but this other species forms another path. And so, you know, this is why they're interested in this this species. So Romano Miramis uh, Colicovorax differs strikingly from C. elegans with respect to cell division pattern, spatial arrangement of blastomeres, and tissue formation. So these are all three different things that uh, are different between these. The spatial arrangement is interesting. Cell division patterns are also interesting. And of course, tissue formation is interesting. One of the things that C. elegans has that a lot of other organisms don't have is this uh, uh, sort of deterministic uh, type of development where the cells will become, you know, its fate is determined sort of in its lineage. Whereas a lot of other organisms will have what they call regulative development, where there's a lot of cell signaling and it determines what precursor cells become a certain tissue. So if you take, you know, uh, any number of cells, they proliferate, they're in a certain spatial location, they'll become that tissue. And C. elegans, uh, it's, it's, you know, the tissues are related to their spatial position, but they're, if you took a cell, say, from the uh, back of the worm in the, in the posterior end and moved it to the anterior end, that cell would not transform into anything like the neighboring cells. Uh, whereas if you did this in another organism like a mouse, you would, that cell would take on the fate of where it was placed. So, you know, if you put, took a, a muscle cell out of the uh, posterior end, out of the tail of a mouse, and you put it in the brain, it might take on a, a neuronal fate. Of course, it also might become a cancerous cell, but that's a different uh, topic. Um, so this is these these two different species vary in different ways. Um, our study reveals a number of unexpected phenomena. Uh, these include unique polar interphase microtubule caps forming in early blastomeres, uh, destined to undergo asymmetric cleavages. So you get these divisions that are asymmetric instead of symmetric, meaning that in symmetric uh, divisions, you get two cells. And in this other species, you get a lot of one cell divisions. And then you get either like some sort of polar body, which doesn't do anything, or, um, you know, so you don't get the symmetric division uh, pattern that you see in C. elegans. Um, embryonic cell lineages of reduced complexity with predominantly monoclonal sublineages meaning that every sublineage in this other uh, nematode is maybe a specific type of tissue, whereas the AB lineage in C. elegans is made up of many different types of tissues. Um, so that's a different uh, a difference there, generating just a single tissue type. Uh, the third difference is construction of major parts of the body from duplicating building blocks consisting of rings of cells a pattern showing some resemblance to segmentation. So this is kind of, in C. elegans, we don't really see segmentation. We see like nerve rings and things like that. But in these nematodes, they have rings that are replicated across the body from anterior to posterior. And so it ends up looking like a segmented worm, so like an annelid. So you have this uh, segmentation that occurs. And is, I don't know if they... Uh, I mean, since it's a nematode, they probably don't have uh, Hox genes or segmentation genes. So this is something that emerges separately from that. But you get this sort of, uh, you know, these these pat these sort of modules that repeat. And so this is something that you see in in uh, different types of segmented animals, segmented worms, segmented uh, other segmented invertebrates. But you see it here as well. And so this is something that you often see in terms of modularity of the phenotype. So sometimes phenotypes will develop module or evolve as modules where you have different parts that are then connected later on in development. Um, so that's interesting. Uh, a fourth difference is prominent differences in cell fate assignment, which can be best explained with a global shift 
affecting all somatic founder cells. So this is just, you know, the idea that you have these differences in how cell fate is assigned between C. elegans and this other species. And, you know, they don't, uh, they, it just goes back to like a lot of the early founder cells of the lineages. So in C. elegans, you have eight founder cells at the eight cell stage. And these each of these founder cells found a lineage. So, you know, you have like, I think ABA and ABL and, and cells like that that uh, generate their own sublineage. And those sublineages are often functionally distinct. So some generate muscles, some generate uh, epiderm, you know, epidermis, some generate uh, germ cells. And it's based on what the, the founder cell is. If that founder cell is, uh, you know, has the sort of the machinery, as it were, for a certain fate, then all of its descendants will have that fate. And so changes at that point in development, at the founder cell stage, which is a really early point of development, will depend, will will make a, a difference in what the lineage tree looks like. That's what they're referring to here. So to go through really quickly, uh, this paper kind of lays out for this species, they show, uh, they show a, a phylogeny of, of nematodes. So you can see there's a lot of diversity here, that this is the the uh, clade number two. This is where they're talking about for this this species that they're interested in, for this, what they call clade, which is a group of species that they're interested in. And C. elegans is way up here at clade nine. So C. elegans is, diff, uh, is separated by quite a bit of evolutionary distance, and they share a common ancestor right about here, which is this way back in time. It's almost to the base of all nematodes. So it was pretty early on that these two species diverged. Um, and so they kind of talk about the differences between them. They talk about this new species. They give some information about it. Um, and here's some microscopy images here. Uh, these are cellular events during early cleavage. So you can see that this, it goes into a two cell state. They call it P1 and S1 and then S and P so P is here. This is the usually the posterior end of C. elegans. S1 corresponds to AB. And S1, of course, divides into three different cells here. And then it, there's this whole, you know, set of S lineages in this other nematode that don't necessarily mirror what's happening in C. elegans. There are differences in how these lineages emerge. And so you can see that there are actually some asymmetries here because you start with three cells instead of, you know, uh, always dividing by two, you know, one to two cells, you get these three, three S cells and then one P cell. So that's an asymmetry that you see very early on. And so then that has an effect on the entire lineage tree and how that unfolds. Um, and then they have some other, they, here they have some examples of different spindles um, in the cell. So this isn't necessarily uh, very valuable, at least at the sur on the surface, but if you're interested, you can read about that more. Um, and then these are the lineage and fate maps here for uh, the different uh, species. So this is showing the lineage tree here of C. elegans, the lineage tree of this new species, and then A. nanus, which is another nematode that is yet different, but it's closer to C. elegans. And so here's the lineage tree here where you see... Um, these dip so this is the lineage tree here this is the fate map and then these are the different um differences in them so you can see that there's quite a bit of difference between this species and c elegans and then a nanus is a little bit different it's actually closer to what you see in c elegans um and so uh this is this is a cleavage pattern and fate designation here uh, so this is reconstructions of early embryonic stages based on 4D microscopy. So these are actually in their position in space. So these are cells, uh, these are sister cells where these lines are connecting the sister cells, the products of a cell division. And so you can see that in, in the C. elegans and in this other species, you see the differences here. So you can see these these are what they look like in their spatial positions, and then they show these lines between them, which are these lines that connect the related cells and just showing their spatial location. And so that's uh, some interesting work. 
and then formation of rings of cells and intercalation. So you see that you have these rings that form. Um, in A is uh, A is the hypodermis. Uh, B is where you see hypodermis transforming, and then C is where you have this. Uh, I can't. I don't. I don't see where this is. But this is just this process going through, and you can see these rings that form in the embryo here of these cells. So this is a. These are two microscopy images, and this is a model here, so here the prime. And so you can see that they form these rings that are repeated. Um, and so, the, yeah, this is another figure where they kind of do these reconstructions. They're really nice reconstructions. Um, and they show these colored uh, beads here showing lineage membership, fate, and this. they do a section across the down the like the transverse axis, like we saw with the adult C. elegans connectome or set of neurons where you see sort of looking down from the head. And uh, so this is a nice paper. It kind of gives a different perspective on development um, from, you know, looking at different embryos in the same, uh, uh, in the same taxonomic group. Okay, so Hare Krishna had to leave. Thank you for attending Hare Krishna. Um, we also have this reference by Dick. Uh, this is his book on differentiation trees. And I had a question about that. Uh, I think it was Jia Hong who had a question about how those differ from lineage trees. So I can oh. reach out to him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Differentiation tree is a tree of the cell types. Right. And the lineage tree could be mapped onto that tree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> If they're the same, like in C. elegans, then every cell type is a sing is a single cell. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now this brings up an interesting point about this paper. Uh, I speculated in this old book of mine that the difference between mosaic organisms, which is C. elegans, and regulating organisms like mammals is the range of the differentiation wave. In other words, in C. elegans, something corresponding to the differentiation wave would be confined to a single cell. And in mammals, it's confined to a tissue, which could be millions of cells. Okay, and, and the differentiation waves make the difference. So it's a diff difference between not going beyond one cell or going to n cells. Right. Okay, so the question is, in this, uh, things seem, seem a little backwards here, but uh, the question is, is, is this, all, this new nematode that we're looking at today, uh, does it regulate? Yeah. Is it a regulating one? Uh, and that may account for the difference. The, the way it's backwards is that it's phylogenetically earlier than C. elegans, which is what, what I didn't expect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I think they have, so, well, they have a common ancestor. It may be that they're like, have the same, well, they have the same common be, but, ancestor. But it could be that, cell reg, that regulatory embryos came before mosaic embryos. Yeah. Maybe that's the, maybe that's correct. And, the the ones that don't regulate are the ones that uh, are highly specialized, like uh, Drosophila is highly specialized. And, you know, it's it, it could it could be we're looking at we're looking at the wrong animal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so in any case, it would be nice to see if if there's any way of relating, pretending that they're differentiation waves, which they don't examine, yeah. and see if see if their data would fit that kind of uh, speculation or not, that, uh, that these are more like regulating. Now, I remember in the old literature on snails, if you look at a snail embryo, it's highly uh, mosaic. But if you look at an, an adult snail, it's regulating. Yeah. In other words, you know, if it gets an injury, loses some tissue, it will regenerate it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so the, the the business about whether the earliest animals were uh, 
mosaic or regulating is an open question. And I'd say this, I'd say this paper opens it wide, wide open. Yeah. Do they discuss whether it's regulating? Uh, they don't, but actually C. elegans is not entirely mosaic. There is some regulating uh, cell oh, differentiation. Okay. So like that, but I think in this case, it's kind of the same thing. Like in this embryo, this, this new seat, this new species or this different yeah. species, they, there's a lot of like, uh, there's a lot of mosaic development in terms of the uh, lineage. It's just that the lineage trees are different. The founder cells lead to sort of one cell oh, type. I, or thought, I thought you also suggested that a tissue can be more than one cell in this one. Uh, well, I think that's also true. I think there is more of a role for regulating uh, development yeah. here. So, yeah, so, the, is, yeah. so the question is, you know, is it, it, this would be a good case to check whether or not differentiation waves might be involved in this. Right, yeah. Okay? Yeah. Uh, and and also raises the, the evolutionary question of which came first, mosaic or uh, regulating? Could be that regulating came first and mosaic is a specialization. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which would be interesting. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. That's great. Got to get you back into a nematode lab. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, well, thanks for joining this week. Uh, if we have questions, you can email or uh, if you're in the Slack, okay. uh, we have questions in the Slack or, you know. And uh, have a good week. Okay, you too. Take care. All right. Bye. 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 Yep. Bye. Bye. Bye.